Hey, what's up crew? You might have noticed last week we created an incredible bundle for you for our 200th episode of the podcast. We're giving away some extraordinary value for a price that might blow your mind. You got to check it out. The URL to pick it up is trafficandfunnels.com slash 200. At the very least, go to the URL and look at what is included. It's one of our best offers yet. Check it out. Trafficandfunnels.com slash 200. Let us know what you think. You're listening to The Traffic and Funnel Show. What's up, everybody? Welcome to The Traffic and Funnel Show. Here with your host, Chris Evans and Taylor Welch. It is an amazing day in Charlotte, and I'm so excited that you've joined us today. Taylor, how are you? Bro, it's an amazing day in Nashville, too, okay? Stop being racist and acknowledge the other people in the world. We need rain. No, dude, it's a beautiful day. In this dry land of Charlotte. So we had a lot of feedback, positive feedback, I would say, on last week's episode. If you haven't heard that, go to Traffic and Funnels, our website. Yes, we do have one. And you can check out that episode. We also, you know, we did something crazy, Taylor. Yeah. We did something crazy. We made an offer to the people on that podcast we did special offer i don't know if it's still available it might be gone they might have the team might have taken it down i don't know you is have it to still check available it yeah brian says it is still available well i was trying to use curiosity there guys oh sorry <laughs> my bad hey what are we talking about today we're talking about how much sales sucks and how awesome marketing is the title of today's podcast is sales versus marketing Sales versus marketing. This comes from a comment that Chris made offhandedly uh, a while back about his goal in 2020 is to, what did you say, replace the sales team mm -hmm. or something like that. And, um, and my goal in 2020 is to replace the marketing team, except for I feel like I'm a little bit more holistic in appreciating the other people on the team than Chris <laughs> is. But it's an interesting topic because, um, you know, we have two different goals in the departments that we run. And I thought we could rap about that for a little bit. Do you want to talk about your, what did you mean when you said that? Because actually Sarah, who is uh, on our staff, she like cringed. She said she cringed a little bit. She got nervous because she loves the sales <laughs> team. And I'm like, no, that's not, a, that's more of a philosophical goal. But kind of explain, because we, <laughs> we're not, we're not firing the salespeople or the marketing, yeah. you know. No, I think about it like football. You know, and even though the Panthers have had a, a rocky start this year, uh, Cam is injured. Uh, but anyway, that's another topic for another day. Cam is not good. You even know, he's it's not like injured. A team, that, a team that wants to win the Super Bowl, right? They want to have the best offense in the league. And really, they want to have the best defense. Sometimes the defense will win games. Sometimes the offense will win games. And so I think in... The philosophy that I'm talking about is, is that, right? It's like we have two sides and my goal is that we can win the game on the marketing side. Taylor's goal is that they can win the game on the sales side. And so really, if we're both putting over 100% effort in winning the game, then the goal is we can win the daggone Super Bowl, right? Like we can just go to the highest of heights, to the top of the mountain. So philosophically, that's what I'm trying to get to. Not actually replacing the sales team, but right. putting us in a position where, you know, no matter what happens, talk about hedging for a minute, because this is really something we talk about a lot. And it came from you, if we're being honest, this is, this is you hedging. What does that mean? Yeah. So hedging is, is looking at worst case scenario, right? Because I think a lot of times people don't do that. They don't entertain worst case scenario because I think they're afraid of worst case scenario. And so if we actually go down the trail and entertain what the possible worst case scenario could be, and then build and develop our business and our strategy and our structure and our tactics to deal with that. Like if we confront the worst case before we actually get into it, then we'll set up enough margin in our business to where if we hit that worst case scenario, we will still win the game. We still will succeed. And so I think so many people, they don't entertain that. They're only looking at the best case. They're only looking at, oh man, I'm going to get my leads at $5 versus well, what if I get leads at $10 or $15? Or they're only looking at, you know, converting 30% of their sales calls to sales versus what if I only convert 12%? Like looking at what the worst case scenario is. So we're not riding so close to the line to where we can at any second just go off the edge and, 
you know, have a yes. pendulum swing and losing money or clients or whatever it might be. So it's all about just building safety and making sure that we have redundancy and health in our business. When you talk about hedging, I think of Charlie Munger. These guys are old, man. They've been successful for a really, really long time. One of my favorite speeches is by Charlie Munger. If you don't know, Charlie Munger is is Warren's business partner. And he says, go and make a list of everything that the people who have failed, every activity, every choice that they made, everything that contributed to that failure, and then invert those things. And I think that uh, one of our greatest skill sets as business owners has actually been, you know, you have seen marketers rise and fall. You have seen companies rise and fall, sometimes in the span of 12 months. You've seen people make a lot of money and spend a lot of money and then lose everything. And the way that they make decisions is very flippant. So they assume that, you know, I was talking to a client yesterday. He said, I set a new budget based on two good months. And then I had a bad month. What do I do? I'm like, no, no, no. Don't set a budget based on a good month. Set a budget based on your worst case. And if you can get to a place where even at a worst case, you're still thriving and winning and growing, then your best case is just kind of going to be extra bonus. We're yep. doing that in real estate. You know, people do not understand how, we, how we're making decisions on real estate. We have a matrix that is literally like if we are attacked by the Russians and like literally taken into concentration camps, we would still make great passive income on our investments. And that's kind of yeah. how we're making decisions. It goes back to your philosophy of hedging. I think that marketing done correctly is probably one of the greatest hedges you can have against poor sales performance. And I don't think that it should be one or the other. To me, sales is the ability to really initiate that transference of capital. You get on the phone with somebody, you start talking to them. Maybe one of our sales guys might have 7, 10, 15 conversations with somebody. They're going to build up trust. But in the background, marketing is also doing its work. And I don't think that you can actually separate them entirely. we, We had this conversation last year. We were setting up how we pay people. And I was like, man, salespeople need to be paid more than marketing people. And I was kind of fighting for that. And you're like, but who would salespeople enroll if we didn't have marketing? And the answer was they wouldn't have anybody to enroll at all because marketing is really foundational. So I don't think it's ever going to be one or the other. Um, Although some business models exist without either one, but for us, we're always going to use both of them. Yeah. I think it's definitely a beautiful marriage. There's a beautiful harmony. I think that, you know, how we consider marketing, look at marketing as well is, If you understand what it takes to get someone to pull out their credit card and give you that number and charge whatever amount it is, whether it's $50 or $20,000, it takes a few different elements, right? It takes trust. Yeah. It takes believability, believing that you will take care of them and believing that they can accomplish whatever it is that they're setting out to accomplish. And I think for us on the marketing side, we are doing a lot of work in indirect incognito selling persuasion, right? We are working through podcasts and blog posts and, you know, stuff that you're putting on your profile, um, stuff that we're putting in the group and emails, you know, we are incognito selling. We tell stories about how people just like our prospects were stuck and, and they struggled for so long and then they came through and they bought our program or our service or whatever. And, and through that process and the mechanisms and tactics and strategies that we show and help clients with, um, at the end of the day, they get the result that they've longed for for years, right? And so that's how I look at what we're doing to kind of pave and pioneer the way for the sales team. Right? There's all this like kind of different angles of persuading people, not just so direct, you know, where the sales team is like very direct. Give us some examples. Well, I think an example would be a podcast talking about how we have helped clients, right? One of the, one of our podcasts that, that just comes to mind is the one I did with Rick Mulready. I talked about our business model and why we decided to go high ticket versus selling courses. That was a long time ago. I remember that. Yeah. But it's just essentially answering those objections that are going to be walls to getting them on our side of belief. When you say the walls of belief, what, this is everybody. I just want you guys to see Chris's superpower in action right now. Uh, this is his marketing stuff. He's saying he pulled incognito selling walls of belief. He's just making this stuff 
out of the top of his head. What is a wall of belief, bro? Talk to us about that. Yeah, so if you look at someone who, whatever their story is growing up, whatever they've experienced, out of that, they have created beliefs. Belief that they can't accomplish what it is they want to accomplish, right? So maybe they've had a failed business or they've had a coach that hasn't treated them right and didn't live up to the promises. So they have a set system of beliefs that we need to alter, we need to change, right? Because it all comes down to them having our belief that we can help them. At the end of the day, that's what we have to achieve, right? So whatever lens they're currently looking through, we have to start reprogramming that to where they can see, yeah, maybe this is possible for me to obtain a certain amount of income or have a certain lifestyle or provide a certain way for my family. So for us, it's it's kind of just that micro content and these messages that we're connecting and basically starting to alter their belief system to get on our side of the fence. Right. So we're just busting down those barriers to where they're like, yes, I believe that I can obtain fifty thousand dollars a month in revenue if I have the TNF system. And of course, one of the ways we do that is the ridiculous amount of proof that we have with all of our client stories and all kinds of different industries and stories, like people who have almost like lost their houses and, you know, almost homeless to where they come in and get the TNF system. And now they own yachts. And all right, Chris is starting to feel good. I like this. Would you say the biggest thing that you're that, and when you talk about marketing, would you say that the biggest thing people struggle with is generating that belief or is it something different? Well, I think it's it's a challenge when the business owner or the expert or the consultant, coach, salesperson, whatever, they have to have that belief in spades first, right? Because the prospect, as much as we do marketing and, and we're working, you know, through the pro- podcasts and blog posts and, you know, however we are connecting to the audience, they are initially going to borrow that belief and confidence from the person they're talking to, right? So if you go and you listen to the sales calls, our salespeople have confidence, not that they're pushy or like, you know, uh, just rambling and, but they have confidence that they know without a shadow of a doubt that we can help this person achieve what they want to achieve. Or, or they have confidence beyond a shadow of a doubt that we can't. Because somebody emailed in the other day who was mad because we didn't, um, they were on the call with one of our people and they were like, I don't think that we can help you with your business model. And they were offended. And it's like, in what world do we live in where you're offended that we're not taking money from you because we don't believe we can help you? Like, what is wrong with you? Yeah. I didn't say that. I, I used to would have said that, but you know, confidence either way. I think sales more than anything else is the stewardship of somebody's vision, the stewardship of somebody being somebody's vulnerability and being like, this is where I want to go. This is what I'm struggling with. And the ability to steward that person and position them in a way that they can get what they want. Sometimes the greatest thing you can do as a sales professional is to listen to where somebody wants to go and steward them properly by saying, we can't help you get there, but here is somebody who maybe can and connect them. And I love that when our guys do that, because that shows me that they're actually centered on the client, not on the credit card. Too many people are, you know, their job as a salesperson is making sure that they have a limit on their American Express. And if they do, they're qualified. And I don't believe in that. I think that that's the way that you really get off the rails. Yeah. And that's probably what is wrong with our industry is people have such an infatuation with sales, such an infatuation with marketing. It's all belief. It's all belief, belief, belief. We can help you. We can help you. But there's no stewardship of the actual individual and, and honesty inside of whether you can help them or not. You know, yeah, I think because people are so short term, short sighted that they're looking for the quick tactic, the quick win, the Mm. quick way to get the dollar where really marketing is is the ability to um, get attention, keep attention, invest into that relationship to build trust and rapport. Right. So when they get to the place where it's time for them to make a decision, they are there at least way closer to where, um, you know, someone just got on a cold phone call with a salesperson, they may have a long journey to get them from the point of A to the point of B. Or marketing, our goal is to get them as close to that point to B as possible. So the job of the salesperson is just way easier. Well, 
Yeah. Listen, bro, don't at me. Don't at me, dude. Contextually, contextually easier. Um, who would you say some of your biggest influences are, specifically in the in the world of marketing? I'd say Jay, Jay Abraham, Ben Savanga, Halbert. Um, actually, Dean Jackson was my first exposure, really, to direct response marketing back in the Dizzy. Mm-hmm. That's Dizzy, like the kids are saying. Ogilvy, John Caples, Gene Schwartz. I feel like we're both marketers and we're both salesmen. Like, yeah. It just so happens that right now, Chris runs a lot of point on marketing and I'm running a lot of point on sales, but it's hard for us to actually talk about which one's more important because we actually both do both. Yep. I think it's indirect versus direct. You know, it's like I'm trying to sell to the masses indirect. It's through an email. I'm selling through an email. I'm selling through an ad. I'm selling through a webinar, a VSL, a sales page, where you and the sales team, it's like, you know, through a messenger conversation with someone or on the phone. Can we can we just open up to the audience for a minute and tell them the truth? Yeah, I, well, I don't. I know. don't <laughs> really do. I don't really do anything with sales anymore. I feel like oh. our sales team is at a place where it's so healthy and it's been so good for so long. Yeah, that they, those guys tend to kind of run themselves. You know, which really is the goal. They are some of them. They're some of the most honest people in the world. Yeah, it's totally the goal is to get to the place where you, as the founder and the owner, can. Do what you love. You Go know. out on your boat. I don't have a boat, but thanks for that. <laughs> I was going to tell you, actually, props to you because I got on the sales stand up. So we have a sales stand up for the sales team every day and the marketing team every day. Um, I got on there, dude. I just felt like it was there was just so much camaraderie. Like You could tell like these people are like connected and they're looking yeah. out for each other. It's not just like they're pit against each other. There's crazy competition. It's like right. bloodthirsty animals. You know, yeah. They actually care for each other and and ultimately for the client and success of the client. They probably saw that your name popped up and they were like, oh, we have to take care of each other right now. <laughs> I was like, man, you guys are nice to each other. You walk in there today and they have like knives and Spartan swords out and they're just <laughs> nunchucks <laughs> yelling at everyone. I think that every business in the world is a sales business because there is no business without sales. But I don't necessarily think I would classify TNF as like, you know, we rise or fall based on our salespeople. You know, mm-hmm. we have, you know, because of the unique angles that me and Chris have, we've built in, I think, multifaceted uh, <laughs> layers into the business so that, you know, certain departments can have a rough month or a good month and the business is going to stay relatively consistent. Um, yeah. That said, if you, can't, if you can't learn how to sell, at least especially early on, you won't make it to the later to the later seasons of business. You'll die out at the beginning because you won't have any cash flow. So, dude, who would you say has been your biggest influence in sales? Well, I'm a little different because I feel like I learned sales a lot from marketing. You know, like me and you have similar, not idols, but similar influences because yeah. my first, you know, when I got into the game and I was really learning salesmanship, I was learning salesmanship in print, which is what the old guys refer to as copywriting. So I took a lot of my chops from that. Um, And once I got in the game and realized that I was going to have a difficult time collecting 15 grand, 20 grand, if I couldn't talk on the phone, um, then I got into like the, the typical influences, Kevin nations and uh, you know, Jordan Belfort has some amazing training on sales and you reverse engineer as much as you can. Once I got into a level of proficiency. Then I got hungry for sales training and I went back into the old guys, um, you know, Jay Douglas and like old sales trainers Mm -hmm. who were really prominent in the 1950s. The problem that I found is a lot of their stuff doesn't really work as much anymore because it was a different era. And one of our trainings that we're doing tomorrow is on the stages of selling. So I went back and I've read books from the 1920s on sales. I've read books from uh, Stan Ballou from the 1980s on sales. I've gone through all of it. And really, when you look at the 1950s versus the 1980s versus the early 2000s to now, there was a big change every 20 or 30 years in what people needed to buy. And so the old stuff doesn't work as much anymore. And that's why we're training what, what we know in sales mentor. If you ask me who my marketing 
influences are, I could probably answer them a lot quicker than sales influences. Well, I'd say honestly, you've you've probably been greatly influenced by Jay. Yeah, hundred percent. How you sell and how you've taught the team to sell is really um, in the best interest of the client, you know, and hence the story of the person who we didn't take because we didn't have full confidence that we could help them. That's what's best for them. Or some of these other scammers out there, some of these other charlatans, they would take that money. Dude, Jay is a legend. I feel like Jay is a legend and we need to get him on this podcast for round two. Because yeah. he needs to, uh, people need to see, people need to see him. They need to see him in all of his glory. He fixed his hair and everything for us and we need to get him on again. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's true. Talk to us, Chris, let's get into 2020. If you're, if you can handle that. Your hair looks great, man. Let's get into 2020. Um, Dude, hold on. Let me preface this just for a second. So we've had four years of pretty extreme growth by most standards. Um, we're talking several hundred percent growth curves year after year for four years. I, I feel like personally what, we, what we're learning is that there's more power in doing less but doing a better job. So less projects, you know, but doing higher volume and doing a better job of those projects. Uh, what do you feel like, you know, talking about sales versus marketing, obviously 2020, we're going to have the sales team. We're not getting rid of them. We're going to have the marketing team. We're not getting rid of them. But what are your thoughts when it comes to building both departments so strong that they don't need the other? How are you going to do that? So I think that what we can do a way better job of is home growing our people for our flagship programs. So what I mean by that is, you know, our flagship program is thousands and thousands of dollars. It's hundreds of millions of dollars. And there's a disparity in the marketplace. And I think we can go out and get market share of helping someone who's maybe at zero or one and get them to five. Right. So they're primed, prepped and ready for our higher ticket programs. So um, strategically, it's it's going out in in monopolizing the attention of the market through the products that we're releasing, like our newsletter, developing that trust, rapport, relationship, and then offering other um, services and and value adds at lower price products to get them to that place where they're like ready to join elite, right? Or client kit. That's really good, man. I don't even know how to follow that up. My plan with sales is just to like leave them alone and let them figure it out pretty much. So... At this point, at this point, everything in our business comes down to, I think, volume and then optimization inside of the machine. This is a big learning lesson for us is that we haven't optimized very well in a lot of different areas. So um, that's one of the things I'm excited about for next year is really optimizing the health and the effectiveness of every single level inside the business. And uh, it sounds like you have a better plan to do that than I do. So well done. Well done, bro. You get the trophy. That's crazy, man. Like how much opportunity there is for growth um, and so many angles that we haven't seen and we haven't explored. Yeah. That does It won't necessarily require us to go and spend another $500,000. Do For yeah. example, like we don't have any affiliates and so many businesses, they are, they're grown from affiliates, right? So there's so many ways that we can add revenue and profitability without um, taxing the system. I think that's probably why I don't have a good plan for this is because your skill set is really good. And like you will look at a tree and you'll look at everything around the tree and everything under the tree. And you're like, what can I do to optimize the environment that this tree is in to make it a bigger tree? And I look at a tree and I'm bored and I just want to go plant a hundred other trees. That's pretty accurate, isn't it? That's pretty accurate. Yeah. So you're like, what's the plan for optimizing? I have no idea, but I'm real excited about the real estate stuff. We've got you know a couple new businesses in our back pockets that we're looking to launch January, February, or March. Um, dude, that is my game. Like, let me start as many things as I can, and then Chris comes in and cleans up the mess, Sprinkles makes it profitable, a fairy dust on it, puts a little magic on it, says Taylor, get out of the way and let us build this real. That's that's the plan. I love it, man. That's all I got, man. All right. Thanks for listening. Go check that out, and we'll see you next time. See ya. 
Thanks for listening. For more from Chris and Taylor, visit trafficandfunnels.com and get a free gift just for being a subscriber. That's trafficandfunnels.com. Hey, what if you could be in the boardroom where we sit around and we plan out how we're going to grow our eight-figure company month in and month out? If you've ever wondered how traffic and funnels grew so quickly, there are strategies, there are formulas that you can model in your business that our clients are modeling to scale to the moon and back. This is an amazing program. It's called Insiders Access Monthly, and we've put together a couple words on a page that you can actually go and check out this offer, trafficandfunnels.com slash IAM. You will not be sorry, I promise you. Let me know what you think.